The town of saint has a particular place in tour history. The place in question being a sweeping left-hand bend in the road made treacherous by rain and the world time trial champion's determination to push the outside of the envelope in search of his second straight prologue win. Chris Borman ripped the envelope, broke his ankle and nearly got finished off by his team manager in the car behind. That was 1995. 13 years on, another British rider has the chance not to erase that piece of history, but to tag on a new paragraph of his own. Mark Cavendish is probably the fastest sprinter in the world at the moment, and today is the Tour's first sprint finish. Hello, well this is the finish of today's stage in Sambria. Not a perfectly flat sprinter's run-in by any means, but then there are limited opportunities for the fast men on this year's Tour route. Now I remember standing here in the rain in 1995 waiting for a British winner who never arrived. So none of us needs reminding of the dangers of building up a homegrown hero in advance, especially when there's so much that goes into just delivering a sprinter to this point in the race. You only have to look back to last year and Mark Cavendish's debut tour when he was denied the chance to even compete for a win by a series of scrapes and crashes. Nonetheless, he's a year older now, even faster and full of belief that he's going to take a stage. Here's Ned Bolton. He can still pass largely unnoticed. A shy smile which masks an iron self-confidence is all you get when you're first confronted with Mark Cavendish. But in the next few days and over the next couple of months, that could all be about to change. At the minute, I'm, I'm on the hottest draft season site. And... The last 200 metres, you, you, you can't deny with fact. You look at me, I'm, I'm the fastest, you know. 11 wins in his debut year, then came the difficult second album. He's barely put a foot wrong. And I was coming so fast, Tom didn't see me. He thought he was so far ahead he could raise his hands, and he raised his hands, and yeah, I was coming that fast that I could come underneath him. And, and I got it, so it was special for me. That usurped the natural order of things, even if it left Cavendish himself a little unbalanced. More, though, would follow. On the Giro, he shot through two finish lines first, only the third British rider in history to win a stage there. He even gifted a third victory to a teammate and finished the race too, stronger and quicker than ever. If they needed convincing about his potential, his big-name rivals have all the evidence they need. I mean, he's a really good uh, sprinter. He's uh, for sure one of the fastest ones. And uh, last year, uh, he took, uh, I think he took a big step from last year. So, yeah, he can be one of the biggest ones this year. So we'll see. Okay. Oh, well, he's achieved a lot so far in his career. He's doing really well, uh, developing really well as a, as a rider and as a sprinter. Uh, this year, when his first stage is in the Grand Tour in the Giro. So, you know, I think he's definitely capable of winning a tour stage. He had wrongs to right from last summer. The fall in Canterbury and then the slight and not so slight misjudgments, which along with more bad luck meant he left France last year with nothing more than bruises. But with no bone and all Bernati and a muted McEwen to beat this year, the field looks ready for him to rip through. Listen to this for an endorsement of his potential from a man who knows about the race better than almost anyone in the peloton. Cavendish, I mean, that, that kid's uh, an incredible cyclist. I mean, it's a real honor to be uh, teammates with him. You know, I've been I've been teammates with the best in the world, best in cycling, but I see so much in him, uh, so much potential, even though he's already reached uh, higher levels than, than most cyclists in the peloton, but I think you'll be seeing him win for the next 10, 15 years. Meanwhile, his assault on Madison Gold in Beijing, alongside Bradley Wiggins, counterbalances his ambition over the coming weeks. It's not that he wants to choose, he wants them both, and he might just get them. The high esteem in which Mark Cavendish is held by his teammates is matched only by the esteem he holds for the tour itself. This year, he's in it for the long haul. I want to finish. It's not fair on the organizers, it's not fair on my team, it's not fair on myself if I say I'm going to go into the Tour of Defence with wanting to, wanting to quit halfway, you know, I want to finish. Now, there's today's route, 164 and a half kilometers, a ride to Saint-Brieuc, the equivalent of Belfast to Dublin, 197 kilometers raced out of 3,559. Now, it's another up and down day, four climbs along the route, three intermediate sprints, and the riders will actually come up the incline that Chris Boardman slid down once they come into Saint-Brieuc. Now, yesterday's most high-profile crash victim, Mauricio Soler, did start, I'm happy to say, but the word from the Barlow World Camp is that having come into the race with a micro-fracture of one wrist, he's now got a tiny fracture in the other, so his chances of making Paris don't look good. 
And that's how the general classification looks going into stage two. Alejandro Valverde has a one second lead over the first dozen riders behind him. Philippe Gilbert is second, perhaps more significantly. Cad Evans, the pre-race favorite, is sixth, and Frank Schleck seventh. Oscar Pereira, the only previous tour winner in the race, is 10th, just ahead of David Miller. Frank Schleck's brother Andy and Carlos Sastre, the other two CSC riders, are 17th and 14th, respectively. Now, with no defending champion, there was no yellow jersey in the peloton yesterday. There is today, of course, although Alejandro Valverde isn't expected to waste much first week energy defending it. And Chris, I think a lot of the energy today might be taken up battling the wind, depending which way it's blowing. Well, very blustery conditions out there. These trees are protecting them from the worst of it, but there are some exposed sections. I think after yesterday, everybody very nervous and everybody praying that it doesn't rain. Looking at these dark clouds, it's anyone's guess if that's going to happen. Well, no rain, but a puncture for Mark Cavendish just under 50 kilometres into the stage. He got a bike change pretty quickly and was paced back into the race by his teammate Adam Hansen. Now, the first attack of the day came from Sylvain Chavanel of Cofidis, and he was quickly joined by his fellow Frenchman and one of yesterday's breakaway group, Thomas Verkler, who was in search of mountain points to hold on to the polka dot jersey. As we join them, they're on the third and hardest climb of the day, the third category Mur de Vacatania, and they have a lead of just over three minutes on the peloton. Well, we're looking now at the two leaders who are inside of the final kilometer of the Mur de Bretagne, the first third category climb of the Tour de France this year. Thomas Vockler in second position is the leader of that classification, and I'm fairly certain that he will get himself maximum points here. That's if he can find a way through and uh, find the space to try and overtake us, uh, Sebastian, Sylvain Chavanel there. That seems to be the uh, the logo for the Tour this year. Uh, the We love the Tour de France, uh, the Tour d'Amour. And uh, there's a little game of words there because Côte d'Amour almost rhymes with l'amour, the word for French in uh, meaning love. It's about 150 metres to go to the top of the Mur de Bretagne. And Thomas Vockler looks to me to be suffering quite a bit. Well, as they continue to climb here, Paul, uh, Syl Sylvain Chavanel here is having a really good season, that's for sure. And I think uh, six wins already. Now, isn't he going to allow Vorkler to go through? I would have thought he would have done, wouldn't you? Well, I think he's uh, maybe thinking a little bit further down the road there, and he's trying to move up himself. Uh, so he will get four points. Thomas Vorkler will get three, but uh, still... Thomas Fuckler will extend his lead in the overall classification. And Phil, just a little bit further down the yeah. same climb, look at these weather conditions. We're three minutes back down the road, but this is the way it is today. Uh, it's raining again at the finishing line here, but when we've looked at the riders, they've been in the sun, but they are separated by less than a mile, and it's absolutely throwing it down on the lower slopes of the wall. Now, don't blame him putting his little cape on. Not going to help very much. Well, this is what it looks like at the back on the Mur de Bretagne. And as I was telling you, Phil, this is quite a stiff climb here, and you can it see that by the, the way these riders are having to get out of the saddle to battle with their machines to keep going forward. Best place to ride, as I've always said, is in the first 15 to 25 positions, which is why the yellow jersey is right there. And if you look down that list of riders, most of the other contenders won't be too far away from the front either. And Valverde has got all eight teammates alongside him. Now, there's number 51. That is Mauricio Soler. The rider who we think is still riding with a fractured scaphoid. They're not sure. His right wrist is heavily bandaged. His left knee is also bandaged from that fall yesterday where he lost big time on the run into the finish. But if he can just hang in there a couple of days, hopefully he'll come good when he gets down to his favourite terrain, which is the high mountains. And it looks as if it's Agri Tobello trying to get themselves a few points. Christophe and that's Moreau. Christophe Moreau in second place. Yeah, maybe they want to give him the points. He was denied a chance of defending his win in the Dauphiné Libre because his team wasn't invited. They're a wild-card entry here. Well, he actually said, Phil, before the start of the Tour de France that one of his goals this year was not to try and ride high in the overall classification, but to actually look at an individual stage or have a crack at the King of the Mountains classification. Maybe he's laying the first foundations for his wall here. A little tester to see just how he's feeling, I suspect, there, and he's done it rather smoothly. No reaction from the field. And uh, that's the peloton. Just over three minutes uh, is the peloton there. As they go over the top of the Mur de Gramont, there's one small climb left, and it comes in about uh, five or six kilometres' time. Two minutes 42, the gap is closing again. 
And at the top of the little climb that's on our way, we're on it now, it goes through at 68 kilometers from the finish. And this is the last climb of the day, the last official climb of the day anyway. And then I think we'll see the chase start to reel them in. Yeah, that's what I always hated about a day like this, Phil, because uh, there may well be official climbs on the day, but there's a lot of climbs <laughs> maybe after this one, which are probably twice as tough. Absolutely right. Well, Vaucler, you can't keep this man down, can you? He attacks on a daily basis, and this is only the second day of the tour, and he's been there two days out of two. Well done, Thomas. Yes, well, uh, the last time the, the race of uh, the Tour de France came into the town of Saint-Brieuc, it was people Pozzato got himself the victory. Here's Thomas Vaucler, this time no challenge at all. Vaucler getting himself another three points in the bag. That takes his number of points since the start of the Tour de France in this competition to 19, which is a nice serious lead that he has over everybody else. I would think we could see Thomas Vaucler now keep this lead for about four or five days because he's obviously going to go for it. And you can see... Uh, just look at how much those trees are being battered at the top there. And it really is a rather a turbulent day here on the Tour de France this afternoon. And I think it's going to be a pretty turbulent finish. It's a, it's a tortuous route into the town of Saint-Brieuc as the riders come into the last four or five kilometres. And there are a number of very nasty traffic circles as they make their way down. And uh, fortunately, there is nothing really in the way in the last kilometre. It's fairly straight, except that it does go down a fraction before it kicks up to the finish. And it could make it for make for a rather dangerous sprint. I think we'd be looking at names like, of course, uh, Robbie McEwen, the great Australian sprinter, to come forward and try and get himself a victory. But watch out to the, for the new uh, British sprinter, Mark Cavendish, who'll be looking to get his first Tour win. Well, again, Paul, the, it's almost the sun is out. I mean, the wind at the finishing line here now is absolutely gale force and it's blowing the rain away, but it is very, very strong. Now, in those last few kilometres today, uh, the crosswinds, then we swing right around on ourselves to circumnavigate Sambria to come in from another direction. And a lot of experts are saying this will absolutely smash the bunch to pieces. Well, it's a tough uh, run in towards the finish, and I think those weather conditions are going to affect it quite dramatically. There's a problem at the back here for one of the riders from Rabobank who's uh, slipping back. This is Lawrence Tindam. And uh, just out of interest, a quick story about Lawrence Tindam, Phil. He didn't start his life as a professional cyclist or even as a cyclist. He actually was a soccer player and decided to ride one of these mass participation bicycle races through the Alps and thought, wow, this is quite interesting. So what he decided <laughs> to do was take up cycling. And now here he is riding the Tour de France. Gosh, it is amazing, isn't it? And, uh, well, Eddie Merck started out as a soccer player for Anderlecht, a great Belgian person soccer team but he did well to choose cycling I think I think Eddie Merckx made a, the right decision as I think so too has uh, Lawrence Tindam but by the way he happened to be the goalkeeper absolutely 329 is the gap at the moment as we see the crosswinds continuing to blow here two riders still clear at 331 Brittany and its constituent parts such as Finisterre, which literally means the ends of the earth, is where France hits the Atlantic Ocean and just crumbles away. In fact, it's barely France at all, and the people of Brittany hardly feel French. Like Asterix and Oblix, though, they are a bunch of overachievers, and on the Tour de France, no Breton has overachieved more than the badger himself, Bernardino. Because it's my terrain, it's my, it's my region, and then it's a place where we do a lot of vélo. To understand this in a region often battered by Atlantic gales, you probably have to go back the best part of 100 years. The 1908 Tour, as well as the 1907 edition, were won by a Breton-born Argentine who raced under the pseudonym Lucien Petit Breton. His languid expression and faultless side parting betrayed none of the understated courage of the man. Remember, these were the days of 350, sometimes 400 kilometre stages on heavy steel bikes. Bernardino has a theory. C'est pas différent, mais ce sont des gens qui ont été habitués à, à, être, à, à la dure. Parce qu'au départ, c'était beaucoup de marins, des marins et des paysans, des agriculteurs. Donc des gens qui étaient habitués à travailler dur, ce qui fait que quand ils faisaient du vélo, ils trouvaient que c'était facile. Et c'est ce qui a donné peut-être euh, qu'on ait eu euh, des îles Bobet, des Robic, euh, moi après, et puis certains autres encore. 40 years after Petit Breton, Jean Robic won the Tour for Brittany in 47. Nicknamed Leatherhead because of his fighter pilot's helmet, he was a man with few graces who would allegedly stand in the doorway of restaurants and bellow, Oui, c'est moi, Robic. 
After him came Louis Saint Bobet, the great French rider of the post war era. He won three times from 53 to 55. He was more matinee idol than Breton farmer, even though he had to overcome a career long battle with saddle sores. He rode through it though, and he was brilliant. Then to Eno. In 1985, the last of his five tour wins was kick started by victory on his own doorstep. J'ai gagné un prologue à Pumlek. Euh, autrement, bien sûr, j'ai fait tous les critériums qui existaient dans, en Bretagne avant. Donc j'en ai gagné pas mal, oui. Understatement, pride, Bretons are a bit different. They sort of have to be. Il y a toujours du vent ici Il y a très souvent du vent, oui. Du vent, la pluie, euh, ça peut changer en 10 minutes, ça peut être le soleil. C'est un peu comme dans les îles britanniques, mm -hmm. ou comme à Jersey, c'est exactement la même chose. On est au bord de la mer et la mer y joue énormément. Ce qui fait aussi que le, les coureurs bretons ont du tempérament et sont solides. I'm not so sure about that. I would have thought that the Breton win would produce skinny, streamlined riders. But you don't contradict Bernard Hino, or he's apt to clip you around the ear with the four ways of his five tour victories. Either way, two Frenchmen are prospering in the win today. Sylvain Chavanel and Thomas Verkler still out front. Now Thomas Vokler there just at the front of the race, in fact, has just stopped at the side of the road. There's a little bit of a mechanical problem there. I'm not sure what that is at all, but you see how quickly that was orchestrated. The team manager was up alongside him very rapidly indeed. He knew that Vokler wanted to change his bike. He was out of the car, spare bike in hand, and that change probably took something like four to five seconds. And very shortly, I should think he'll rejoin Sylvain Chavanel at the front of this bike race. But any time in the Tour de France, any time around any corner, we would never really know what can happen. So I think at this sprint point, Thomas Vockel is going to have to be very happy to get second place. There you go. Just having a look here to see what the problem is with Andy Schleck. Now Schleck uh, could really be the dark horse of the Tour de France this year. He finished second overall in the Giro d'Italia last year in his first attempt at a three-week uh, Grand Tour. These are the two chasers. Moreau's had a pretty quiet season, really, uh, and looking up at uh, 37 years of age, he really is one of those riders getting uh, very much into the autumn of his career. And their time gap now is around about the one minute mark, I would say, to the two leaders, and uh, they're two minutes ahead of the main field. So the two leaders now, I think they've got the news that the two chasers are coming across. I'm just thinking, Paul, if uh, Lelay and Morrow do get up here, maybe the tactics won't be as silly as we thought. Well, I'll tell you what's happening. In fact, uh, Vokler and uh, Chavanel, I think, have sat up and they're waiting for reinforcements to come from these two riders because obviously uh, gap is four good. pairs of legs are a lot easier to succeed than just the two that they've had for the, uh, the duration of their breakaway this afternoon. And they probably think that accepting reinforcements is a good tactic. It makes sound uh, thinking that because they know the wind and, that, and these guys, especially because they're French, they know exactly where the problems are. I'm just going to ask Paul Sherry now, when was the last time we had four French riders and nobody else in a breakaway? I was just, going to think, <laughs> I have I was no just idea. thinking the same <laughs> thing myself. Uh, it has been an awful long time since the, the French have dominated this event. It's been an awful long time since it's been a French winner. And 85. the last French winner was, in fact, a, a Breton, Bernardino. Yes, and he would have been at the front today. I can tell you, if Bernard had been riding, he's a very proud Breton. And we're heading to where he lives, uh, or lived, in a Finiac. That's where he did most of his training. He was brought up. He used to ride to uh, college there on his bike, uh, probably thinking that one day he'd win the Tour de France five times. Well, maybe not. Maybe not, but I tell you what, he's a tough character, and he's still pretty tough now, in fact, uh, Bernard. You know, his nickname is uh, the Badger, Le Blero, because when you used to put him into a corner, he would certainly come out fighting. Four riders up front now, and uh, if they do get together, two on the same team as well. And this is uh, now giving us quite an interest. Now, you see Moreau, even though he's a teammate of Lele, he's allowed, or let me, David Lele, do most of the hard work here, 67% of it. I think that makes sense, and that's an indicator to us that Moreau, he might also be uh, the unwilling man in the breakaway right now. He didn't really want to be here, but he's gone with his young teammate in his first Tour de France, who lives in the region. Yeah, well, the fact is that they've uh, made that junction at the front now, so we've got four Frenchmen in the lead with an advantage uh, hovering around the three-minute mark, and it'll be, see how much, it'll be interesting to see now how much work that uh, 
Christoph Moreau is going to put into this. But of the leading group, it's still Sylvain Chavanel, the best place rider overall. He started the day field 31 seconds behind Alejandro Valverde, although I have to admit, Christoph Moreau is not too far behind that because he was 39 seconds behind. 53 kilometers, the gap, 2 minutes 44, just knocked off for second there. The peloton themselves now beginning to concentrate. They've never allowed the breakaway. Two guys have got across and joined it, but the gap has not opened out. They still have this breakaway under control. They've still got them pretty much pegged, and as you can see, uh, the white jerseys of Francaise de Jeu coming to the front, and the reason for that is because they want to pull that breakaway back before the end to give, of course, Philippe Gilbert, the man who uh, started the day in second here. place it's in the points classification. That, uh, Thomas Voigtler, who's had one flat tyre in Emirates a day and hasn't affected him at all, has gone back for his dinner. And 2 minutes 43, at 51 kilometres to go to the finish. And there's, uh, I think, we've elevated Alejandro Valverde just now. Well, you could say that he was flying, and he was certainly flying yesterday on the climb up he to was. the finish in Plumelec. And uh, just by the way, one of the riders in this leading breakaway, uh, David Lelay, he's the leader, Phil, of the French uh, Cup. It's a series of races bringing together all the top French races. I've completely that. forgotten about that. Good yeah. one. Well, thank you very much. He actually <laughs> got that lead by winning the Tour of the Finisterre and, of course, the Trophée de Grimpeur, the race of the climbers. And that is virtually is what guaranteed him his ride on the team here in his first Tour de France. So he has good legs at the moment. Uh, I think he's uh, shown us that today to get across to the breakaway as uh, he probably will try to keep this away. He will dream, but, of course, he hasn't had the experience. He's only been in the Tour de France for two days, and uh, all of the experience of the other three riders know that these breakaways very rarely succeed at this sort of speed. Three new big uh, corporate sponsors coming into the sport over the last uh, couple of weeks leading up to the Tour de France. Team CSC have got a new sponsor, which has signed up for the next three years, the, the Saxo Bank, a European bank. Uh, Team High Road, which formerly was the T-Mobile squad, has uh, garnered themselves a sponsorship from uh, Columbia Leisureware from the United States, trying to uh, increase the, the width of the brand name awareness uh, as they support a global team, because Team Columbia, out of nine riders, uh, represent eight different nationalities. And, of course, Garmin has come in to sponsor the new American team on the spot on the block, uh, Team uh, Garmin Chipotle, which is, in fact, a very young development squad. And the orange team you're looking at here, well, they've been around for quite some time. That's Uscatel Uscadi. Welcome back to the Tour de France. Second day of racing today. We're on the road to Sambria and we're looking forward to an interesting finish down in the city. But before we rejoin the action, the vast majority of your emails have virtually alluded to the same question. Why isn't the defending champion Alberto Contador here? And why isn't the Astana team riding? Well, Contador actually joined Astana over the winter. And so he was excluded when the organisation decided they wouldn't invite Team Astana to this event. Now, why is that, Paul? Well, the reason they decided not to invite Team Astana, Phil, was because of the controversy that the team has been associated with over the last couple of seasons. But it's not the same Team Astana nowadays. In fact, it's a completely different team structure mm -hmm. and there are a lot of different riders on board. All right, now it is a controversial decision. It was taken by the organisers of the Tour de France, ASO, and I have to tell you, they're the only organisers who have barred this team from competition this year. So, as it's controversial, we thought we'd ask the riders what they think. A lot of people don't understand why they were left out. It's a complete, obviously they've had their trouble in the past, but it's a completely different team. And I'm friends with a lot of the guys on the team. Um, you know, obviously one of them in particular is, uh, you know, won the Tour last year, and it's hard to, to, to see him not be here this year because I think he's also one of the, the best young talents out there and, and can win several Tour de France's in his career. I think it was, an, it was an unavoidable decision. The Tour de France had to do it. ASO couldn't invite Astana this year. It was, just wasn't possible. And I think that's unfortunate and, and, and it, it, it's a very it's, it's sad for such a gifted, amazing rider as Alberto Contador, but I think he knew the risk when he signed there last year. He knew that it was a team that was kind of on the on the bubble regards the Tour de France and, and these events. Yeah, I think the ASO got burnt very big the last couple of years and they've had enough. And, you know, it doesn't matter if who you are, they're trying to make a point, you know, don't come and stuff up our race. But I also understand Astana, they go, hey, listen, we fired a few, a few or a lot of people. We got a new sports management coming in. The team is running by complete new persons. We get a lot of new riders and we really like um, also providing jobs for like 60, 70 people. 
So it's for them, it's hard to understand that the doors closed for them. I think they're, they're doing everything within their power to earn their place back. And they'll, they'll get to ride the Tour de France next year. And, and this is the way cycling has to go. The riders can't just pay the price, the teams have to, otherwise no one learns. And so Astana are paying a price. Well, if Astana were in this race, today's chase might have been a bit more organised. No sign of Mark Cavendish's Columbia team pulling at the front of the peloton yet, and the four men out front are still holding on to their lead well inside the last 20 kilometres. Just having a look there at the Breton flag as we're at the back end of the main field, and the back end of the main field now is covered in riders from Case de Pania, the team of Alejandro Valverde, and the reason for that is they've done the majority of the pacemaking in the race so far in pursuit of this four-man leading group, which is now down to around about a 58-second advantage. There's a slight pause here now as the sprinters are trying to wait and decide which one of the sprinters' teams is going to turn up the gas to chase down that leading group of four riders, because I do believe that the main field now feels that they've got this pretty much in the bag. Quick step have turned off a fraction there, Phil, and this is a very dangerous game to play. They're starting to put that little yeah. bit of poker together. But they don't want to chase just yet, but they want to pull them back. It's because the sprinters haven't sent riders up to ride. The sprinters are afraid too. There's a little bit of a, a psychological situation developing in the front of the peloton now, because normally each team that has a, a recognised sprinter who could win would be expected to send a man into the chase, and nobody's sending anybody up. So now a little chance here perhaps we're stretching it just a bit they get one minute but remember that man's going up and down the motorbike uh, the official gap has already stretched out a little bit 62 seconds not a lot it all helps red spot though that doesn't look so good well we're still looking at uh, eight kilometers and an inside of 10 kilometers to go now that would be ideal for the main field and just looking at the front end of the main field again it's it's credit credit case Depan, you have to say the black and red jerseys of the the leader the yellow jersey Alejandro Valverde have decided well if the sprinters don't want to keep the pressure on we'll keep it up there because as we get a little bit closer to the no finish. choice and He's they no choice smell that victory the teams of the sprinters will start to work because if they if they don't uh, close that gap down then silver sylvan chavanel will be the leader of the tour because remember overnight his advantage or deficit rather is 31 seconds on valverde at the moment he sits at a minute and three and going up again and if he prizes that gap open and wins by more than 31 seconds he'll pull on the yellow jersey and not just Brittany, but france will go mad Chavanel almost won himself a stage in the Tour de France a little while ago, and he was caught inside of the last 300 metres when he was in a breakaway with the American rider Chris Horner. Credit Agricole Paul have put a man on the front now, so the sprinters at last have had to crack and send men up to the front to drive. This breakaway has hung for a little bit too long for these guys now. 7.3 miles to go, just under 12 kilometres, and it is Craig Agricole for the God of Thunder Tor Hushoff. He says he wants to win the green jersey. He's the only Norwegian ever to have won it, and he wants it again. Well, he needs to start laying the foundations for victory in a competition like that, Phil, because uh, he didn't do too well yesterday on the climb up towards the finish, but it certainly was not his kind of finish, I have to say. But here you can see all of a sudden the urgency has come to the front end of this main field as the sprinters now are starting to bear down on their prey. And they've got uh, three quarters of a minute advantage, but it's still a, a difficult, uh, tortuous route. Now it's up to Team Quickstep on the front. There's Fabian Cancellara on the left-hand side there with the orange glasses on, and he's a man who could create the surprise here this afternoon, although I'm surprised to see him uh, so close to the front. Right behind him is Frank Schleck in the red, white and blue jersey as the champion of Luxembourg. Very shortly, once uh, they get to a four or a 500 metre straightaway, they will all of a sudden be able to see that leading group of riders. There's the 10 kilometre pointer, a slightly more accurate time check at 45 seconds. The time check we give you on the graphic at the top of the screen is worked out on uh, two motorbikes uh, carrying GPSs, so it works out the difference between the two riders, and we use it more of a guide to notice whether the time is going up or coming down. It does give us an idea. Over on the left, Rabobank. And they should be looking after Oscar Freire this afternoon. But again, there's, there's a lot of teams of Phil moving up to the front end of this main field to, to wait to get themselves organised. But just look, this is the, the windy little uh, road that takes us into the outskirts of Saint-Brieuc.
That's right, and we're now turning gently round now. The wind is swinging from the shoulder. Eventually, it will come onto their noses as we race up towards the finish. But what worries me, Paul, is, and, and uh, but you, you, you remarked that they will probably take out the central reservation of 500 metres, but they haven't. They've put a straw bale on it, and it is in an incredibly dangerous position. Well, I'm sure that that information has been communicated back to the riders, which uh, I have to say uh, allows me to back up why I still believe it's very good to have race radios. I know you don't agree well, with no, me. No, it's OK for security. <laughs> it's the tactical bits I don't like them giving to the riders, but I like to think that they've got the brains to race for themselves. <laughs> uh, 40 seconds is the gap now, and uh, just look at that main field stretching out into that big, long line. There's a lot of nervous riders at the front end of the main field. It's at this point that everybody's starting to tighten up their shoes. They have Velcro straps on the shoes to keep them nice and tight, and they will make sure that they're as tight as possible and getting themselves uh, in that psychological position, Phil, to take all of the risks necessary to win a bunch sprint in the Tour de France. 36 seconds, the catch is not far away now. After a cold and blustery day in the saddle, a stiff drag like this is hardly the ideal welcome for the out-and-out -out sprinters. They're going to have to work really hard today if they want to be in with a shout at the finish. Really difficult terrain too, undulating like this for their teams to control. So I think as we get to the bottom of these short ramp and the race bunches up, that we can expect to see some final kilometer attacks. Our hopes of course, well they rest with the man from the Isle of Man, young Mark Cavendish. Can he be the first person to get a win for his new team? He admits himself to being arguably one of the fastest men in the world over 200 meters, but it's getting to that jumping off point that's the real challenge. This might not be the fast, flat finish he'd prefer, but the chance to win a Tour de France sprint stage is a precious thing, and they seldom come gift-wrapped to order. So come on, Team Columbia, marshal your forces behind Cavendish. We're dying to call in the miniature Manx wonder and help us expunge some of those dark memories of saint -Briel. The narrow streets now of Saint-Brieuc, 30 seconds at four and a half kilometres to go, and still no one team has got themselves to the front. They need to organise themselves now if they want to catch those guys. There you can see the riders from Silence Lotto, 30 seconds is all that they have got, but if they don't pull it back right now, they may well have left it just a little bit too late. So around the corner, over the bridge, nice and safely for everybody. 24 seconds is the gap. The roads are unkind to the leaders now, I have to say, and they will turn into a block headwind. The wind is not quite as strong as when we came on air, but it is still pretty powerful. Oh, that's not good. They just pulled out yes. the neutral service vehicle. That's a bad sign, and psychologically, it whacks a rider in the face because he knows the main field are coming back very quickly. Well, Moreau now is absolutely burying himself, but look at Thomas Vogler looking over his shoulder, not feeling very confident now. He's wondering whether or not the main field are going to come back. The team field that has decided to set the tempo on the front end of the main field is Team Quickstep. Now, is it for Gerd Stegemans or is it even for Matteo Tosato? Well, Tosato will be in there somewhere. He is a strong man. But look at the efforts now. This is an incredible chase, and we'll see Team Columbia move up. They've got blue jerseys down there. They're the lighter all blue strip because they're thinking of Mark Cavendish as well. George Hinkap will be the strong one. There they are in the distance. Oh boy, they've left it later. 2.8 kilometres. This is not a done deal. And that's what Sylvain Chabonel thinks. He's moved off the front and he's got just enough time to make the finish. Well, he's got to give everything now. This is a do or die move. You saw there that uh, Thomas Vukla tried to get across the gap. Now that Chabonel has opened up his advantage, he has to ride and not even look back. He's got to make his body hurt. He's got to dis not listen to the message from his body to stop the pain he's got to keep the pain for another two and a half kilometers he's actually extended his lead over the front end of the main field this was the move that he had to make and he's flown alone you are looking at a former time trial champion of france here and, and in fact he is the current time trial champion. he just won it a week ago as he now settles in to the chase on his own he has the legs if he's strong enough and he's the absolute hero of the day he could have led this race for 162 of the 164 kilometers Kilometers. There's the peloton now snapping up the breakaway one by one, but they may have left this a little bit late. Look now at the long line there of riders from uh, Team Columbia. You can see they're trying to get themselves organised as well, and I think uh, George Hincapier is right up at the front end of the main field, but peeling off. The rider from Quickstep is peeling off. Now there's the main field. There's only one man left in front of them, and it's uh, Chavonel. 
Well, a look, a grim look of realization on the face there of Moreau and Voiclep. There's only one man left now, and that is Sylvain Chavanel. The clock is counting. Eight seconds it is. Case de Pon are trying to guide Valverde safely off the front. And this is a long, hard climb, but he's still there. That was Luis Leon Sanchez on the front there for Case de Pon. doing the pacemaking for the yellow jersey. The other teams now are starting to crack a fraction, and Chavanel has still got a six second advantage with 1.7 kilometers to go. There's a lot of tired bodies at the front end of that main field. Philippe Gilbert, Phil has moved up into third position. Team Colombia's organization seems to have become a little bit disorganized, and now it's really going to be all up to Alejandro Valverde. Moving up the right hand side there, there's a couple of riders from Silent Slaughter, but Chavanel really has to dig deep now if he wants this one to survive. And I tell you, this is a mean, mean run into the finish. Well, just remember, between okay. kilometers two and one, we're on a beautiful road. You can see it here, well barriered and nice and wide. We close down a little bit between one kilometer and 500 meters, and there's a nasty kick there. There's also a central obelisk in the middle of the road, but the catch is coming, and now it is every man for himself. As we start, it's Fabian Cancellara, and there's been a crash already at the back of the race. A quick look at the riders, none of the favorites are there. That was Leif Hoster who was down, and one man is clear, and Cancellara is at one kilometer. He's trying Trying to do it again. He did it at Compiem when he wore yellow last year. Pipo Posato is coming across though in the lime green jersey for Team Liquigas, and they're in third or fourth position. In fact, it's Cadell Evans taking control of the front end of the main field. Posato wants to win this again like he did in 2004, but you've got to be a tough man to catch Fabian Cancellara. This is just like the last stage of the Tour of Switzerland. Well, this is the tricky bit now. They've just gone past uh, one section of the course. He's almost on the line, but he knows this time at 500 meters he's not quite going to make it Pazzato a few deep breaths here he's humped up into the slipstream of Fabian Cancellara who's the world time trial champion and the race is coming across the gap Jerome Pino is there again he was third yesterday the yellow jersey is going to have a go Valverde surely not another stage win for the champion of the tour so far up on the outside is that Hushoff who's launched an attack yes it is it's the god of thunder roaring but the challenge is coming and this is Kim Kirkham coming on the shoulder of Tor Hushoff and on the line Tor Hushoff has got the win and Kim Kirken will be there in second place I'll tell you what, Phil, there's been a little bit of a split in the bunch as well, oh, so we'll have to yes. do a serious amount of addition here this afternoon. And Philippe Gilbert is one of those riders who must have gone down yeah. in that accident as well, so he will disappear from the top end of the overall classification. Juan Antonio Fletcher coming across the line now, and this split in the final few kilometres, I think, Phil, really has affected the result of the race. And this is how it all happened. I thought for a moment Valverde was going to grab the wheel there of Tor Hushoft and beat him to the line, but the rush was on. But the speed of Hushoft, it was a typical finish for that man. He's such a strong man as we go uphill. Kim Kirken made an incredible acceleration over the last few metres to come up and grab second place there, just ahead of his teammate sprinter Gerald Cholik. He did indeed, so that was a terrific result for Team Colombia, second and third over the line. This is the arrival here of Rubens Bertoliati, the rider from Sonia Duval who went out and crashed, and of course Juan Maurizio Soler, the rider from Colombia and Team Barlow World. And we'd been waiting 7 minutes 18 seconds, Mauricio Soler having lost over 10 minutes in the first two days, and looking like a major doubt to make it through the third. There's the stage result, Tour Hussoft ahead of two Team Columbia riders, neither of them Mark Cavendish. His team leader Kim Kirchen was close for the second day running though. Gerald Churlich was third, then came Robbie Hunter, Eric Zabel, Yuri Trofimov, Oscar Freire and Jimmy Kasper. Finishing safely in the bunch were all the main contenders. No splits according to the race judges, so they all got the same time. Alejandro Valverde was 12th, Cad Evans 21st. David Miller finished alongside Mark Cavendish 26th and 27th. So somewhere in the sea of heads behind Tour Hushoff's large and distinctive one was our hope for today. Sprinters have a habit of sitting up once they know they're not in with a chance of the win. And once Cav's teammate Kim Kirchen had picked up the green jersey after his pair of consistent finishes on the two opening stages, he offered an explanation. I actually was a little, little hard stage and was the climb and a lot of wind. Uh... So we, can't, we couldn't control actually from the front, so uh, it was really hard for him also to get up to the position. But uh, I think Gerald uh, did also third, and uh, 
I think we have a good team. Maybe when it's when it's a little more, a little bit more organised, uh, Mark Cavendish will have his chance and the whole team uh, in front of him. Maybe tomorrow. For sure, tomorrow. For sure today, though, it was Tour. Six stage wins in seven Tours de France now, and he'll be looking to relieve Kirken of the green jersey once that race hots up. He spoke to Ned. Tour, that was a real statement of intent today. Do you consider yourself now maybe favourite for the green jersey? No, it's, it's uh, still early, uh, but, uh, I mean, my form is great, and uh, t today uh, everything works well. The team, uh, my lead at my own, uh, man, uh, Mark Renshaw, so, but it's still three weeks to go before we end Paris. Typical t Tour Hushoft win, wasn't it? Strong. It suited you, this this finish. Yeah, it did. Uh, I knew it was a good sprint for me. Uh, I did this sprint before uh, for our fourth or fifth place, and then I won it. So I knew it was a good sprint, but, uh, yeah, it's... But, I just almost can't believe I won it again. A great day for Tour and a pretty good one for Alejandro Valverde. Well protected by his team and still on course, in theory at least, to be the first man for 73 years to wear the yellow jersey from start to finish. There were some changes behind him though, chiefly Kim Kirchen moving up to second. Cadell Evans is up a place two to fifth and David Miller is into the top ten at number seven. The gaps are all the same though and they continue back down the line. A dozen riders at one second off Valverde and 30 odd at seven seconds. Mark Cavendish remains two minutes behind thinking about stage wins. Chris Froome is 6.34 back in 170th. So two stages down in the 2008 Tour de France, including Chris, the first sprint finish. Uh, Mark Cavendish didn't feature in it, but uh, it's in the mentality of the sprinter to just look ahead to the next day. And uh, tomorrow is another chance for him. They often, if they're not in the hunt, then they give up completely. And we saw the same with uh, with Robbie McHugh, and he was round about the same place. So with just a minute to go in the event, they decided it wasn't for them, and they let go. So hopefully tomorrow another day, and it's very much more suited to the sprinters the running. Anything to uh, pull out of uh, the first couple of days in, in terms of the overall? Anyone who's impressed you? I suppose Valverde's laid down the gauntlet to everybody else. Yeah, I, I mean, we've seen the conditions have really forced the favourites to ride close to the front to make sure they stay out of trouble. We saw Castapagna ride a lot today. He used a lot of energy, but they decided that was the lesser of evils to make sure that they, uh, they stayed safe. We've seen, uh, we've seen all the favourites. Evans featured heavily at the front as well. So everybody's been forced to play, and it's, uh, you can see who's strong and you can see who isn't and the favourites uh, will be heavily protected tomorrow in advance of the time trial on stage four. All right, before we go, uh, let's take a look at the competition, your chance to win a fabulous road. All right, let's take a look at tomorrow's stage. There it is, 208 kilometres from Saint Malo down to Nantes. Edinburgh to Aberdeen would be the equivalent. 362 kilometres race so far, by the way, around 10% of the total. Now, this really is a flat sprinter's stage. Look at that, three intermediate sprints for those interested in picking up points for the green jersey competition, and not much else before what should be a blazingly fast finish in Nantes. We'll have highlights of that stage for you tomorrow night at 7. 7, of course, our regular time for highlights throughout the week. Now, what is new this year is that even when we're not live during the week, you can be. If you're a Sky Satellite or Virgin Cable subscriber, you can see every pedal stroke of every stage Monday to Friday by accessing your red button. Don't forget itv.com forward slash tour, of course. That's the place to download the podcast or send us an email. Otherwise, we will see you back here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for stage three. San Malo to Nantes, another chance for Mark Cavendish. Good night. Anywhere the sleep dust lies, it decorates your eyes when you get some sleep.